Good morning. Today is Tuesday, April 9th. I'm going to call the meeting to order at 9.05. Um, are there any additions from administration for the agenda? Good morning. Administration has two additions for the agenda this morning. The first edition is regarding a declaration of nursing week. And a second is regarding a community fire guard initiative with the town of Canmore. Thank you. And will those be going under new business? Yes, please. Okay, so five is nursing week declaration. And then six is Fire Guard Initiative. <clears throat> Any changes to the agenda from the council table? Um, I do have one item from Jay that I believe should be coming up into uh, new bit new business and that is item j11 it's a letter from the minister of rural alberta forest forestry and parks or sorry item j10 still from a letter from minister lowen um, and this is regarding uh, the eastern slopes and the ghost area so if we can move that to item h7 i believe it requires a little bit of discussion and um, some direction for our, for administration. So, all right, is everybody okay with those changes? All right, can I get a motion to approve the agenda as amended? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Thank you. Any further discussion? I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you, motion is passed. All right, uh, looking at the minutes from uh, the previous council meeting from March 12th, this is page three of the agenda package. Are there any errors, edits, or omissions? Go ahead. I just saw one little typo um, or wording on page nine of the in the um, memorandum. Um, it, to me, it, it seems like it should the the reply of administration will work with the roads foreman to schedule a tour of the MD prior to their retirement. Oh, sorry, that's the next one. Oh, is that? Oh, okay. I actually, it's not part of in the minutes. Oh, okay. The questions are. Sorry, oh, the questions guess, are in the minutes. It is in inquiries of administration from council. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just seems that. like it should say of. I guess there is proper. Never mind. Are there any other? Is that its omissions? I did not see any. So um, can we get a motion to approve the minutes? Go ahead. I make the motion that we approve the minutes from the March 12, 2024 regular council meeting as presented. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you. Uh, councillor reports. Councillor Smith, I know you're dealing with a bout of pneumonia here, but uh, just do your best and you can keep it short. Well, thankfully it is short. Um, I met with quite a few ratepayers over the month, which was lovely to hear from everyone. 
Um, but I'll highlight on the 13th of February, um, Folklore was in the library, so I was wearing a couple of hats there. And they spent the day doing a bunch of research for a forestry project that we're doing with the Human uh, Heritage Resource Committee. Uh, and it was, it was wonderful hearing about some of the historical facts that they're finding that I had not heard yet. So, as well as all of the other things that I attended with all of you lovely humans. I'll let everyone else touch on those. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Fritzmores. I had uh, another good month. Uh, not too busy on the meeting end, but <clears throat> with the rest of our council, we did get the chance to attend the RMA conference this month. And I'd just like to point out one of the things that got to happen was MLA Waskowski had invited <clears throat> all of our council to attend question period at the legislature, which proved to be quite the interesting time for all of us. Uh, interesting to watch our politicians act like high school kids and scream and pound. So I'm sorry, but it is the way that they do it. And we, we know that, but it was just quite the uh, time to see and to be able to take part of. Um, yeah. And as well, within that day, we got the chance to have another meeting with MLA Waskowski, and we got the chance to sit down with MLA McIver that day. Wonderful, thank you. That was quite a sight, and I wasn't sure that's, I didn't know that's how question period was conducted, but yeah, open my eyes. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Councillor James. Thank you. Um, I think that, yeah, it was a kind of a short month for me. I did attend many meetings that you'll see in the following uh, minutes of this meeting. Um, but I would like to highlight um, one of the activities that I participated in at the um, Rural Municipalities of Alberta conference that was in Al up in Edmonton um, this spring, which on... Um, which we had been attending to as, a, as we attended as a full council, as well as our CIO attended with us. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, one of the activities that I participated in um, because I want to. I kind of thought of this as a little bit of a succession planning for for council and um, understanding. Like I've been hearing many um, people in my community or in the municipality, if they sit in on a public hearing or they, they come to an event, they're always kind of surprised by how things happen and the, the, um, the governance models that we um, kind of go by. And I wanted to highlight a, um, a program that all of the councillors um, are participating in. Reeve uh, Roosevelt has completed this program, but it's um, called and what we call the EOEP, um, which is the Elected Officials Education Program, which kind of helps you really understand and direct on how to governance wisely and to understand the importance of that good governance. Um, the course that I took this um, at that conference was called um, Council's Role in Strategic Planning, which was really good, really informative. They don't give you a hard, cold, fast, this is how you do it, but they give you lots of really good ideas to go back and speak with your, you know, to work with your council going forward as you're always developing your, your strategic um, priorities as well as how to communicate with your administration. And it's a really great program, and it really makes our role up here a lot less daunting. So, yeah. Thank you for that. It is a great program, and I'm really happy to see our council embracing uh, those EOEP courses. And uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to attend those, because they really are uh, very valuable for us, and lots to learn from those. Um, I also, I actually had a bit of a quiet month too, um, surprisingly, but, uh, one of the items I wanted to talk about just from the RMA 
convention as well as just our meeting with Minister McIver, uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs. And just to let uh, the public know that we are still continuing the conversations with uh, as many ministers as we can about the increasing demands uh, on our infrastructure and resources uh, as we see increasing uh, amounts of tourism uh, coming into the MD of Bighorn. Uh, we've also talked to him about um, the forestry trunk road and uh, and it's the upgrades that are potentially needed in there if the tourism is going to continue to increase. And then emergency responses and incidences on Crown land and looking for some funding sources uh, to help our municipality as well as other municipalities that are responding to these emergency incidences and not being compensated for, for it. So, um, and another highlight from that, from RMA, from, for me and from my perspective, and I'm not sure if council is aware of it, but I think it's wonderful how we can go to RMA all together. We sit together, we have dinner together, we go to the hospitality suites together. Um, it really highlights to me that we're a council that likes working together. We enjoy each other's company. Um, there's a lot of councils out there that go to RMA and they and everyone sits by themselves. <laughs> they don't. They don't have dinner together. They don't go to hospitality suites together. Uh, they. Uh, they are pretty independent when they get there. So, uh, yeah, it's wonderful to see our working relationship and uh, that we enjoy each other's company as well, not just at the council table, but outside of it as well. So thank you for that. All right. Um, next on the agenda is item D, business arising from the minutes. And this is follow-up to the March 12th uh, inquiries of administration. CAO Tut, I'll let you present this one. Thank you. Good morning, thank you. So there were two inquiries of administration at the March council meeting. The first was Councillor Smith, Smith had asked if we have a vehicle use policy. Currently, the response to that is administration has been unsuccessful in locating a vehicle use policy on record for the municipality. Um, next step would be seeing what other municipalities in the area are doing with respect to that, if that is the wish of council. Uh, additionally, Councillor Smith asked if a request can be made for the roads foreman to provide a tour of the MD for those interested before um, their retirement. And we will continue to work with Mr. Fassett to schedule a tour of the MD prior to his departure. Thank you. Can you remind me of the retirement date? I know it's May. I just don't know which date. It's the 31st of May. Okay. So we've still got a little bit of time. Thank you. And Councillor Smith, is there anything that you want to say coming from this? Uh, memo? Not at this time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess if, uh, if there was a desire for a vehicle use policy, uh, we will be, I guess, maybe discussing that uh, in the future. All right. Uh, next on... The agenda. Yep. Oh, go ahead, CEO. Sorry, thank you. Just to further clarify on, on the vehicle use policy, I think that that may be a good topic for a future strategic planning uh, session, just to discuss, uh, I think, just a policy discussion, not necessarily specific to this one. But. Thank you. I think that is a good topic to include on our upcoming strategic planning session. All right, um, next on our agenda is a delegation starting at 9.30. I don't know if we should wait for that or what does administration think?
I think if we did a 10 minute break, that may be more appropriate. Any of the items that are following the delegation, I think, require more discussion, so they'll be more time consuming. Yeah. So in the interest of not having to post pause right. a discussion in the middle of a discussion, if we just do a, a 10 minute break and then come okay. back at 9.30. Okay. If they arrive earlier, we can shorten the break and get it started just before 9.30. Okay. I think that's appropriate. Is that everyone's in agreement? Okay. I will call a 10-minute break here while we wait for our delegation to set up. Thank you.
All right, welcome back to our council meeting. We are just getting set up here for our delegation with SARS. Um, and ladies, I might just let you take it away from here. <laughs> if you could introduce yourselves. Sure. Thank you. Great. Is this one? Yes. Okay, so good morning. It's great to see all of you again. Uh, we missed being able to bring you an update last year. You had a lot of things going on, I think. And so we're super happy to see you and bring you an annual update. And thank you formally once again for being a very long time partner with STARS. So I'm Glenda Farnden. I'm the Senior Municipal Relations Liaison. It's a long handle, meaning that I have been working with rural and urban municipalities across the entire province of Alberta and into northeastern BC for the last 18 years. So I've had a great opportunity to work with your council and previous councils. And I'm very pleased to have Jackie Seeley with us as well. She is going to be, has joined our team in order to help me because it's a very big province. So she will now be uh, serving Southern Alberta, which will include yourselves as well. So she will be in the future bringing you your annual updates. Good morning. Yes, it's my pleasure to come each year and bring your annual update. Or, you know, so basically, I was in nonprofit for a number of years. I live in the small town of Bassano in southern Alberta. So, and also served on council out there. So, you know, I appreciate the work that you guys do for your community, and I'm very, um, you know, very thrilled to be with Stars in support of this essential service. So we'll get started. So first and foremost, on the very front page there, you will see a little bit different logo. We have rebranded. We uh, Next year, STARS will be celebrating 40 years of serving Albertans. We're very, very extremely grateful and proud of the fact that we have remained a charitable entity all these years, ensuring that anyone that needs STARS has access to STARS. So in... In, in, in keeping in time with that, you know, if you find yourself in a worst-case scenario, STARS is your best hope. And we can't do it without partners like yourselves and our chain of survival partners as well that help us every day in order to ensure that we can do what we do best. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Thank you. On an update for the financial services, so previously we did have a 10-year affiliation agreement in place with Alberta Health Services, which expired in 2020. We have been year to year since then. That was for 20% government funding. In 2022, we did receive a top-up from Alberta Health Services to 50% of operational costs. So this is based on basically it costs approximately $10 million per base, three bases in Alberta, Edmonton, Calgary, and Grand Prairie. So $30 million per year operational cost. Does not include our um, emergency link center, our dispatch center that is dispatched for all six bases across Western Canada. It does not include education, outreach, or training components, and it does not include administration costs. So strictly operationally related. So they did top up to $15 million per year block funding. So we have been receiving that. This year is pending. We are in very high level discussions with Alberta Health Services now, hoping to secure another long-term 10-year service agreement and hopefully at this $15 million block funding. So more to come, Jackie will have more to come at your next update on the results of these discussions and negotiations. So in the meantime, our STARS lottery just finished last week. We were very fortunate that, you know, that has been running for more than 30 years. It's a very well-respected lottery across Canada. And it usually always nets us around $10 million net which pays for one base in Alberta. So we did achieve that again with Albertans. We have reached that goal. So that moving forward, that still leaves us roughly $18 million per year that must be fundraised each year for all the other components. 
So with that, you know, that comes from the corporate sector. It comes from a lot of long-standing community events as well as our municipalities that continue to support us annually like yourselves. We're generating collectively right now just about $2.2 million per year annually that helps to offset that $18 million that must be fundraised each year. So it is very much a united effort. Next slide, please. So this will give you an idea now as an update as to where we're at now across Alberta and into northeastern BC. So everywhere that you see that's shown green is a municipal supporter of STARS annually. So you can see that we're very much starting to unite the entire province. There's only a few white spaces left that are still current non-supporters, but we have most requests out to all of them as well to join the municipal initiative like yourselves. So the red boxes, now those represent the municipal leaders across the province. They are represented with their logos on the helicopter. They have long-standing, very significant commitments, and we are an actually a line item in their annual budget each year for, uh, through emergency protective services. So then the yellow boxes represent our regional leaders, which MD of Bighorn is one as well. These are those municipalities that are giving at a minimum $2 per capita up to $90 per capita and everything in between. So they are our municipal, municipal leaders. Now the ones that are shown with a um, little star, those are the municipalities that have now have complete regional partnerships, meaning that every town and village that lies within a county's boundaries are also supporters of STARS annually along with their municipal district or county. So you can see that that is growing as well. So we, we're very uh, happy to have just welcomed Beaver County this year and uh, in southern Alberta, Wheatland County is the first to have complete regional partnership. Next slide, please. Oh, and I should say, um, it shows there we have welcomed, in this past year, eight new rural municipalities. And it says eight urban, but it's now nine urban, because we just last week uh, welcomed City of Brooks as the first city in southern Alberta that has joined the municipal initiative as well. So it is growing, and it's very much a united effort in order to ensure that we all have access to a robust health and safety network. Next slide, please. So here's a five-year overview, including um, what's happened so far this year within MD of Bighorn up to March 31st of this year. So you can see that overall, on an annual average, you're averaging about 22 missions per year throughout your areas. Now, Canmore Hospital interfacility transfers are included as well as the majority of interfacility transfers occur from a rural scene where that patient has been taken by local ground ambulance to the nearest hospital, which would be your Canmore Hospital. And then, of course, because it is of a critical nature, STARS is called for these patients as well. So including that really gives you a good sense of what is actually happening throughout the MD of Bighorn. And 70% is scene calls versus 30% for your intercritical transfers. So. You are a very, you know, more remote area, which does include having a lot of scene call activity as well. Next slide, please. So this is information that has been 10 years in the making. Let's look on the left-hand side first. We were able to go back and access utilizing patient postal code only. No other patient information other than the postal code where they lived at the time they were flown by STARS. So you'll see that there's two different communities on the left-hand side that are represented here. Now these do also include your rural residents who will have an address that has a postal code for one of these two communities. So in total then, 121 total residents within your boundaries have been flown by STARS since 2010. But more interestingly enough is on the right-hand side. The listings across the bottom or the red dots. Now, they represent the areas where these residents traveled and needed STARS. 
So 121 in total were flown. 92 residents were picked up actually within your boundaries. 29 residents were flown from 16 other locations across two provinces. So again, when you see all of the red dots, you can see the little blue outline of MD of Bighorn's boundaries, and then all the red dots that are outside of the boundaries. Accidents and illness do not happen just because you're close to home. And this is a testament to the value of our partnership together. Your residents have access to STARS wherever they may travel across Western Canada and the four prairie provinces that we serve. Yes. I just have a quick question about this. Um, is our residents from Canmore and Morley considered part of the MD of Bighorn in this? If in this, um, if they are in the town of either one of those, yes. But also the rural residents that have a Canmore postal code. So it is all residents that are in within your boundaries, not directly MD of Bighorn residents only. Does that make sense? So residents of where? Not residents of Morley and Canmore, including rural residents that have that postal code. Okay. I don't know. I don't think rural residents have the same postal code as Canmore or Morley. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm, this, I just believe this is misleading. <laughs> okay. No, we were, we purchased um, postal codes from Canada Post to include all rural areas. And a lot of rural residents will have a post office box or whatever in Canmore where they pick up their mail, this type of thing. So then they're included. Even though they're a rural resident, they have that postal code. Mm -hmm. um, I think perhaps you might find that with um, the eastern part of the MD using a postal code of Cochrane, but I don't know if you would, there are many or any rural residents of the corridor using Canmore, okay. um, but you certainly do have that um, uh, situation for um, the Ward 3 and 4 yes. going East. And I appreciate that. So maybe, you know, next time we should also look at including um, Cochrane as to give you a better idea of what's happening throughout the area. Because, I mean, I'm, I know that it's not directly just your residents. It's just showing within your boundaries the residents that live within your boundaries. That's the way this postal code project was built. So... It, should we be including Cochrane residents as well to give you a better idea of what's going on throughout the area, possibly to include your residents? I'm, I'm not sure how the, <laughs> the residence thing works, but certainly I know that my zip code or my postal code uh -huh. is Cochrane. Um, and uh, what is the, the like the Canmore proportion? Is Are we just looking at like a few or is that a... Uh, Num See, now that we're not able to access the ag exact address, only the postal code. So that's where, because we can't use any other patient information, only the postal code. I, I think what would be interesting is if you have our, the postal codes that are associated with the MD of Bighorn, and you just look at those, because uh, the Can Canmore postal codes are not the same as the MD of Bighorn postal codes. So each hamlet has a postal code. Okay. Uh, and then that will help us identify, at least in the Bow Corridor, uh, the residents. Uh, when it says MD Bighorn residents flown by stars, it makes me feel like there's been 121 residents that have from the MD of Bighorn that have been flown by stars. But yeah, no. the headline doesn't match yeah, I what you're presenting. What you're and also, like, there's still a lot, like I said, this is 10 years in the making, so, so there's still lots of quirks to, to work out, you know. Um, we found the same in MD of Pincher Creek that the fire chief was present, you know, and he knew of, like, nine or ten other missions flown that were not indicated here. And so we had to go back because the block of postal codes that we purchased from Canada Post did not include any of the small hamlets. So most likely this is the same 
occurrence here is we would have to go back and want to have a, a bigger block of more specific postal codes to include all of the hamlets because that's not represented here and so most likely it was not included in um, the data that we were given you know so uh, very likely we'll, we'll I'll go back and take that back because we're still working out a lot of things so if we can dig deeper to have access to every single postal code of every hamlet then we probably will discover a lot more missions I think if we're looking at the postal codes for Canmore and Cochrane, mm -hmm. um, they will give uh, residents, they will give a post office box to someone who doesn't live in their community. So I know of a few people here in Akshaw who do have Canmore boxes instead of Akshaw. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that be renters or whatnot that can't qualify for an Akshaw box, it does happen. Mm -hmm. There are a few in Canmore. Um, I just not it would have to be one very specific postal code, so not the whole community of Canmore, because they're, right. they're their own municipality. Right. And I believe that it's the same with our Eastern residents, that they are given a specific postal code. So as long as you're w looking at just the one postal code from each of those communities, it might better capture it. Okay, I appreciate that. So now it'll just depend on whether or not Canada Post will identify that for us or not. Okay, well, th this is a good learning curve. Thank you very much for that. And we will take that back and further delve into trying to get a, a more closer view. You know, all, res all different municipalities have let us know that definitely um, they do have a majority of rural residents that have a post office box or something in one of the communities. So, you know, that's why we're always saying it does include the rural residents. But I appreciate um, having this little more in-depth insight. So we'll see what we can do and what we can have to present to you next year. Either way, though, you know, it is very interesting to um, identify that overall, you know, the, the value and the testament to partnership is that your residents could be in Winnipeg or Saskatchewan, you know, eastern BC, and still have access to STARS. Thank you for that. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, okay, so a little bit about our H145 fleet. It is a generational investment, and all uh, six bases are H145 operational now. So we're very happy about that. We were able to sell off the remainder of our BK117 fleet to complete this capital campaign. So they are all completely paid for now. Uh, we also celebrated 20 years of having night vision goggle capability last year. So uh, with more than 50% of the calls occurring at night, this is essential uh, to be able to fly at night. We're the first civilian organization in Canada to be able to fly at night, so that's quite remarkable too. All right, so STARS is more than rapid transport. <clears throat> Our emergency link center is located at the Calgary base and they're integrated with all dispatch centers and have access to all resources across the province. They use very precise GIS mapping systems so that's really important for dispatch, uh, dispatching from our three bases and also from HALO in the southeast and HERO in the northeast. So uh, they receive over 3,600 emergency requests per year. 36,000 <laughs> emergency requests per year. So on average, 100 per day. The STARS transport physician is available 24-7 and provides medical and procedural guidance on every critical call. So this is regardless of the mode of transport. So that's with ground ambulance, rotary wing, and with fixed wing. <clears throat> the STARS transport physician can also provide virtual care um, to the rural hospitals, so they can call in to get extended medical and procedural guidance for patients. So that's just great. They also schedule a lot of, um, do a lot of scheduling in advance for things like a neurosurgeon, the cardiac cath lab, or a CAT scan for a possible stroke patient. 
So precious time is being saved on both ends while a patient is being transported. Okay, so let's take a look inside at the H145. This picture says it all. It is an airborne intensive care unit environment. And uh, just a quick uh, glimpse at some of the specialized medical equipment inside is the H1, or pardon me, the uh, iStat lab. So this is no bigger than the size of your cell phone. Um, we can take a few drops of blood from a patient and within two minutes, we can have test results for hemoglobin, blood gases, and electrolytes, which is very important when the crew is monitoring multiple pain management drugs in a trauma patient. All right, and the Hamilton T1 ventilator is fully featured just like the ones you'd see in the intensive care unit. And this accommodates adult pediatric and neonatal patients. We carry universal blood on board, which we're very proud to be the first um, civilian organization helicopter EMS program in North America to carry universal blood on board. We increased from two units to four units in 2019. And we also uh, launched a blood protocol that also helps with either you know, promoting or um, preventing blood clotting. So this has been essential in helping with uh, patients who, yeah, it's called the Massive Hemorrhage Protocol. So it's the difference between the life and death because being able to promote or prevent blood clotting um, helps us, you know, with reducing the amount of blood used in a severe, you know, when somebody's been injured and it could prevent them from bleeding out. The video laryngoscope is also on board. It's an advancement in intubation. The crew member is able to see the trachea right on the screen, and this allows them to navigate difficult airways in trauma patients, burn victims, or somebody who may have been crushed on impact. The EZIO drill is only used in time-sensitive, life-threatening situations where immediate IV access is needed. So the crew member is able to drill into a shoulder or thigh bone to get that instantaneous access to begin um, pain management in severe trauma patients. The handheld ultrasound also provides rapid diagnosis of collapsed lungs, internal bleeding, heart abnormalities, and even fetal complications in uh, pregnant mothers. So the nice part about the helicopters is they do have Bluetooth integrated Wi-Fi and satellite connectivity. So those test results can be sent in real time to the receiving doctors at the receiving hospitals so that they can expedite a, a treatment plan for that patient while they're being transported. So again, saving precious time as every second counts. So, and of course, you know, um, experience and expertise is a critical part of STARS. Th this is part of the reasoning why STARS has been named the dedicated critical care provider for Alberta. So this includes that there is an international Air Medical Transport Conference, which brings together helicopter EMS programs from around the world to allow a team of two to compete against each other at a very rigorous competition. So each year, STARS, we will hold our own internal competition to allow all of our different team members from all the six bases across Western Canada to compete against each other for the final team of two who gets the honor to go internationally and represent STARS at this rigorous competition. They must triage multiple patients in the most inconceivable critical situations, utilizing the high-fidelity mannequins that they are graded on their decision-making as well as timing and, of course, patient outcomes. To give you an idea of this last year in late October, the scenario that our crew were um, put up against was the fact that it was a head-on collision. The father was ejected from the vehicle with a massive head trauma. The mother was still in the front seat, pregnant, and going into cardiac arrest. And the child was in the back seat, in car seat, with head trauma. 
team of two is managing all three of these very critical patients, and then the lights went out at the conference center. And for almost two hours, our crew had to manage their three patients in the dark. No different than uh, coming to a scene call at night. So these are the types of situations that they're up against. We are very proud that we have participated in this international competition now for 21 years straight. We have been top three in the world all 21 years, and we have taken first place seven times out of those 21 years. We are very proud to bring your residents the highest level of critical care available in Alberta. So in closing, we would first like to thank the MD of Bighorn. We thank you for your leadership and dedication to STARS and, of course, your ongoing support. You have been a supporter of STARS municipally since 1990. We celebrate 34 years of partnership together. That's many lives that have saved, been saved because of our partnership. Your current pledge of support has been, you had given us an increase a few years back, and your current pledge of support has been $4,000 per year fixed rate, meaning that there's no fluctuation for us, which we really appreciate because the mission rate continues to increase. Fuel costs are rising. Medical costs and medical supplies are rising. It's very important that we continue to have a fixed rate of support, and many municipalities are following your same lead in the fact that they're moving to uh, away from a per capita amount to a fixed rate of support in their budgets. And it's also ease of process for administration as well. The benefits to your residents are, you know, averaging 22 missions per year in your area is significant. More importantly, together we have maintained for almost 40 years now no cost to the patient. That is really uh, vital. We're now able to not only um, respond physically, but as well virtually to your rural hospital and your medical professionals. Together, we are enhancing rural health care, as well as ensuring that we all have access to a robust health and safety network. And once again, we'd like to extend a special thanks to our Chain of Survival partners who uh, make sure that you know everything is safe and they are there to make sure that we can land and take care of that patient and be off safely as well. So we can't do what we do best without them. Thank you very much for that. Um, when I was speaking with the director of the Link Center, he said to make sure to extend some very special thanks to the Exshaw Fire Department because our crews love them. They said that they are always there. They know exactly what to do, when to do, how to do. And so we also did bring you a calendar and a newsletter as well for the fire department to just please tell them how much we love them. So in closing, we would like to ask that you would maintain this fixed rate of support. Rather than previously where we've always been a four-year pledge, we'd like to ask if you would join the majority of the municipalities across the province that are moving to standing motion, meaning that they've been long-term supporters of STARS, like yourselves, 34 years, and so they know that you know they're gonna continue to support. So we're just asking that we'd be a standing motion, meaning always be in your budget each year. And we will continue to bring you an annual update each year, but we would appreciate your consideration of that for sustainability as we move forward. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Glenda and Jackie. Uh, as always, uh, it's really great to understand what STARS is doing uh, in the MD of Bighorn and for our residents here. And uh, yeah, it's all it's very clear that it's a necessary and vital uh, service that you provide. So thank you very much for, for that. And thank you for the, the shout out to our Exshaw Fire crew. Um, I know they will appreciate hearing that. Um, in terms of the next steps forward, just looking to our CAO, would this come to our next council meeting with in a decision report? Okay. So thank you very much for that. Uh, council, is there any questions? Any questions from administration? All right. Well, thank you very much, ladies.
It was great to have the update. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a five minute break and uh, we will be back here at 10.05. Thank you.
All right, bringing us back here. Um, there is no unfinished business uh, on the agenda, and we're moving on to item G1, bylaw 25Z or slash 23, agricultural district to small holdings district. Uh, CAO Tut, can you please do the introduction? Good morning, thank you. For today's presentation of the second reading for bylaw 25Z23, I would like to introduce our senior planner, Jenny Kasperwitz. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this uh, bylaw 25Z23 pertains to a redistricting application for the northeast and southeast quarter sections, 24, Township 26, Range 7, West of 5th, um, from the Agriculture Conservation District to the Small Holdings District. Um, I just wanted to note as well um, that our recommendation has slightly been altered. Um, it's uh, the phase uh, since this council report was written last week. Uh, we did receive uh, documentation from Shell Canada Limited uh, that satisfies the requirement of a phase one ESA, Environmental Site Assessment, at this time. Uh, so the recommendation has been amended that Council postpone second reading of Bylaw 25Z23 pending the submission of a traffic impact assessment to support the land use amendment application. Um, and Phase 1 ESA has been removed from our recommendation. I'll go through a bit of a background here. I know that this application has been presented at a couple of um, previous council meetings, so I'll, I'll try to keep it a little bit short here. Um, the land use bylaw in the small holdings district does allow up to four uh, lots per quarter section, so that would be eight lots potential for the two quarter sections. They access from Range Road 70, which current is currently constructed as an abandoned gas well access road um, to provide access to two existing ab abandoned gas wells um, uh, on site. Uh, the lands are within the Jameson Road area structure plan boundary, um, and it will. this plan will provide high-level policy direction for both conservation and development in the area. Um, it's anticipated to be complete by July 2024. Uh, figure, uh, there is a map under Figure 1 in the Council report which shows the area structure plan boundary. Bylaw 25Z23 was presented to Council for consideration of second reading at the March 12, 2024 Council meeting. Um, at the meeting, administration highlighted several concerns uh, with allowing the redistricting of the lands um, in advance of the area structure plan being completed. Uh, at this meeting, um, Council had um, postponed second reading of the bylaw. Um, until Schedule D from the public hearing minutes uh, are attached and the questions asked by Councillor James had been answered with regards to the bylaw. Um, so therefore, the application is uh, before Council at today's Council meeting. Since the March 12th uh, Council meeting, several draft technical studies have been completed as part of the ASP project including a historic resources overview, biophysical impact assessment, and hydrogeological assessment, a traffic impact assessment, and a sanitary ser uh, servicing study for the Jameson Road area are targeted for completion at the end of uh, spring uh, 2024, so within a few months here. The draft technical studies um, benefit the land use amendment application, and uh, we've highlighted that in figure two uh, in the council report below. Um, it shows the lands outlined in blue. Um, in light of the information, administration is altering our recommendation from that March 12th meeting, and um, uh, what this would mean is that all remaining technical studies, including a concept plan, will be deferred to the um, subdivision application stage of the project. Uh, the public open house, uh, just for some context on the Jameson uh, Road Area Structure Plan, uh, the public open house was held on March 14th, 2024. And um, as I mentioned uh, below, in figure two, the red shapes indicated areas that should be conserved or avoided, and the yellow shapes on the map indicate areas requiring further study before development should be considered. 
Um, so in, in this highlighted blue area here, um, basically the, the portions that are in red and yellow are steep slopes on the, on the subject site. And these were from maps I wanted to note that were presented at the public open house. So they are public um, knowledge at this point. A public hearing was held on February 12, 2024 in council chambers. In addition to the requirements, um, the required advertising by the Municipal Government Act, um, the notice of public hearing was also mailed to all landowners within the small holdings policy area of figure two of the municipal development plan. Um, I, I, I won't go into details again of the public hearing uh, results, but there is a table in the, um, in the council report here summarizing the, um, the concerns and the support uh, uh, for, the, for the bylaw. Uh, we did receive nine submissions, uh, five were in support and three had concerns and one was opposed. Links to the public hearing uh, agenda package and the minutes are provided in attachments five and six of the package. Um, the public hearing agenda package, I just wanted to note, contains all the submissions and presentations received before the submission deadline of February 9th, 2024. And the minutes includes the submissions received after the submission deadline for the completion uh, uh, for compilation of the public hearing package, but before closing of the public hearing. Um, the late submission that received is not part of the public hearing record. Uh, so we have, we have provided um, several alternatives as well, which are highlighted on page, uh, sorry, I don't have the page number here, but the, uh, the second last page of the um, package. Sorry, I'll just pull that up here. 28, thank you. <laughs> um, so some, some of the alternatives are that council provides second reading to bylaw 25Z23 without requiring further studies or information. That council postpones second reading until the Jamison Road Area Structure Plan is adopted. That council provides third reading to bylaw 25Z23 and that is subject to um, passing second reading above. Uh, that council postpones third reading of bylaw 25Z23 until the Jamison area structure plan is adopted. Um, and the last alternative is that council defeats second reading of bylaw 25Z23. Um, so I am available for any questions on this report. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions of administration? Councillor James. Thank you. Um, through the Reeve, I have a question for um, for planning, and I was wondering if planning department has continued to communicate and discuss this di redistricting application with the applicant. Uh, yes, planning and development has had um, uh, a couple meetings since the March 12th council meeting with the applicant. Um, they are aware of the recommendation that was presented today. Um, and uh, we did receive that information from Shell, um, I believe, yes, yesterday. So we have been in communication with the applicant. Great. Um, <clears throat> could I, um, you highlight some of the um, things within those discussions. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to those discussions with um, the applicant? Um, not besides our, our what was written in the report here. Not uh, we've we've have our recommendation there of um, a traffic impact assessment, and we've removed the requirement for the phase one ESA. Um, so other than that, I don't believe so. There's not been a change of the application through these discussions. Um, like a change in the request for redistricting? Correct. Or there, um, the, because I find that when I 
when I look at the application, sometimes it looks a little different. The wording changes a little. And I'm just wondering if mm -hmm. there's been any changes that um, that council or the public needs to know for this application as it comes forward in the second reading. Is it any different or added or d removed? Um, the application itself, I'm not aware of any changes. It's still for the redistricting from AC to small holdings for the two quarter sections of land. Does anyone have any questions for me on that? You need, anybody need clarification? Did I make myself clear? Go ahead, Director Gavin. Thank you. Through the reef, um, in terms of a change to the application, uh, I guess the only change that would be considered a change would be the additional information provided by Shell Canada. Um, but they specifically asked me not to share that publicly, um, and I guaranteed them that I would not. Mm -hmm. So it is um, submitted, I guess, as part of the application, which has satisfied the requirement for the phase one ESA. But in terms of any other changes uh, submitted by the applicant, no. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question around the traffic impact assessment and um, in terms of process, uh, why is that important to do at redistricting versus at subdivision? And that's part of where my, my hesitation to delay this comes from. Um, and some of the concerns that were, were brought up at the public hearing also seem to be more subdivision related versus redistricting related, um, in my opinion. Um, so why, why is administration suggesting a traffic impact assessment at this point and not uh, delaying it? Like we can require it at, of subdivision, um, especially when we don't know like the redistricting is just purely redistricting how it's being developed or subdivided after that is of little consequence to us at this point. It's just to redistrict, knowing that that will happen at the subdivision application stage. Um, so why the TIA now? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the traffic impact assessment um, besides the sanitary servicing study, that was the only other study that in the Jameson area structure plan that's currently occurring that hasn't yet been uh, developed. So um, this area has been highlighted for further study through the area structure plan. Um, we've, we've reviewed the information that we have so far on the site and traffic is the only outstanding piece. Um, it is quite reasonable to request this at the redistricting stage, especially when this area has been flagged with traffic concerns, um, as we've seen in the uh, public hearing submissions. Um, it's already, there's already concerns with traffic um, by rezoning to small holdings. Uh, this does allow the subdivision of eight lots. So eight, eight lots, um, we don't know yet whether lots will be hauling in water and sewer. Um, that's additional cars. You have to look at the number of cars per lot. So that could be a significant increase in an area already um, having issues with traffic. So that was our understanding there. But you're certainly right. Um, council could defer this to the subdivision stage if they wish. Um, that would be the MPC, the Municipal Planning Commission, that would be um, deciding that. It would not come back to council. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. It, it could, it depends on council's decision here. Mm. Yeah, like I, I certainly think a TIA is required and necessary. I just don't know if it's required at this point um, until we know what the subdivision application is going to look look like. Um, there is a, a conceptual idea, but once the applicant goes in and starts doing some of the engineering work and all the information, gathering all the information that's required for subdivision, their, their plans might change at that point too. So um, you just never know once those that, that information is starting to get gathered what it's actually going to look like. <laughs> um, 
So I understand where the TIA comes in in terms of potential projected population of this area, but until we know, like you mentioned, we don't know if we're going to need water trucks or whatever. Like we don't know that. We won't know that until subdivision. Um, so I'm I'm hesitant to uh, to move forward with the with the recommendation to to postpone because because of that. Um, and I'm not saying I don't think a TIA isn't necessary. I just don't know. I don't think it's necessarily necessary at this stage. Go ahead, Director Gavin. Thank you. Um, further to that is just I, the, the position that our recommendation is coming from is that the redistricting, the purpose of it is for subdivision. We don't know how many lots it may end up being subdivided for maximum, as we know, is eight across the two sections. Making the land use district change, um, addressing some of these concerns at this stage uh, is our recommendation. So, you know, we received some information for the phase one for the ESA that satisfies that requirement right now. Um, our understanding is moving further into this project, particularly by the time we get to subdivision, that there will be reclamation certificates or full reports available for us at that time. Um, but with the traffic addressing this concern at this stage, um, it really is our position just because once the rezoning is done, then we know the intent, you know, after that is to is to subdivide. So I know there's been a lot of question about requiring that information at this stage rather than deferring, but that's the position that we're coming from for this recommendation is knowing, you know, some of those... Um, the potential and get and addressing some of those concerns now rather than later. That you know, as um, as uh, Jenny said, it's completely up to council to you know provide us the direction moving forwards today. But that I just wanted to further emphasise that's where we're coming from at this point at this time. Um, just for clarity, though, uh, if we. Like, we're not at subdivision stage, so technically we don't know what's going to happen if this gets redistricted. So how does how does a TIA get completed based off of just, like, is the question that goes to a, a, a TIA, can this be redistricted? Or is the question, can this handle eight lots? Because if the question is, can this handle eight lots, then it should go to subdivision. If the question is, can this be redistricted, then I think it's premature to do a TIA until we know what is what is designed or what is part of the concept for these eight lots. And sorry, and, the, and that's kind of why it's, it's a bit difficult without a, the concept plan, because the concept plan supported with all these studies, including a traffic impact assessment, would tell us the the lot pattern for the subdivision stage. So that's kind of why originally we're saying concept plan here with the rezoning that tells us exactly what's going to happen in subdivision minus a few minor changes if something comes up. But um, that's where the concept plan would come in. I just wanted to highlight that. So are you asking for a concept plan? We've since amended our recommendation. Um, uh, given the discussions with the applicant and the previous council meetings um, and the information that we learned from the technical studies of the Jameson ASP. So originally we did, but we've amended that. Sorry. And then just to answer your question there, um, it wouldn't be the question of whether this can be redistricted. It would be the looking at the maximum potential of the site. So maximums eight lots, X amount of vehicles, different types of servicing. What is the impact? That would be the question. And then if it ended up being six lots, we work down from there. So that, that would be the question posed. And, and I think that's a great question, but I think it's a great question for subdivision because <laughs> it's irrelevant right now in terms of the redistricting. 
uh, we know what redistricting means, but we don't necessarily know what the outcome of redistricting looks like. Uh, so I guess, yeah, I'm looking for other people's thoughts on this. Kind of get where you're coming from here, and I see, I can see it from both sides too, which makes this a bit harder. This does seem more of a, a subdivision approval, but as we keep reading and hearing from the uh, public hearing, most of the concerns are traffic, uh, traffic related, and with, I do believe that I saw in here something. There's just the one entrance into the site, and the road used by Shell, was that to be taken away? I, that would be the, the only entrance into the property, is that the old Shell Road? Uh, potentially. Um, did have a conversation with the applicants last week, and there were... Um, you know, maybe some concerns flagged about that road, so there may be a slight alteration to different entrances to the site when they get to the subdivision stage. Uh, a couple of different ideas on that point, so it's not 100% um, that that would be the access to the site, is my understanding. Would that not make a traffic, a TIA right now, be ineffective? Well, for the, and I did have this conversation with the applicants as well. Um, so we have two different things here, your traffic impact assessment, and then we also have um, the access approach or driveway permit that we would work with operations on. So they're kind of two different uh, processes. Certainly I think it would be uh, involved in, in the assessment, but it's really looking at um, the traffic counts, volumes, frequency, on the road from the 1A up to the site would be the assessment. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. So those um, concerns of the of the um, of the access um, from the public hearing, I understood as being primarily concerns of secondary access to these two quarters. Um, what are the number of residents that are allowed before an emergency access is required for consideration in a sub for a subdivision? Is that um, I believe I, I was given in a, in a conversation? I believe I was kind of given an idea of of that, and I thought it would be good for it to be said in, in public. Um, I believe it was from you, Haley. Um, Through the Reeve to Councillor James, could you repeat the question again, just for clarity, so we do provide a correct response or determine whether we need to do a little bit of research with respect to that, and we'll address it through um, possibly operations or emergency services to respond regarding the access? Sure. Um, uh, what is the number of residences allowed before an emergency access is required to be considered for a subdivision? Um, and I was wondering if that was, um, in my understanding, in a conversation, um, I thought it was at GPC this, well, no, I was, um, anyway, I thought I had, um, uh, I was wondering if that number was a number that was a MD policy of 16 or 8 or something like that. Or if there was, um, if it was an MDP or an MGA um, policy of access. 
If I could add some insight, I think I know which pol- which what you're referring to. Um, it's more so with the cul-de-sac length in a certain subdivision, and there. Um, uh, it sounds like it might be in our standards. We just may need to dig dig that up. Um, it it wouldn't refer to the area as a whole. So in terms of the Jameson area with one access coming in, I don't think we have a policy on that. But subdivision cul-de-sac length is what I think you're referring to. I think that is that is correct. I guess I, it <laughs> appears is a cul-de-sac. I guess that's probably how that conversation came forward. Uh, so the requirement is in our engineering standards. I just don't have it memorized um, off at hand. Um, so yeah, there's a number of lots in a subdivision that would uh, trigger uh, secondary access. But that's that wouldn't be uh, for the Jamison area as a whole. It would be for the small building subdivision. For a subdivision. And if we had that, um, has that been considered or has that been um, addressed in the uh, review from engineering, I guess? Um, I just found the requirement in our standards. So it is um, part of our standards for subdivision servicing, which are small holding standards references. So any rural subdivision that will result in more than 16 lots shall be designed with the secondary access to a public roadway. Um, so that review would come when we uh, look at the, um, the subdivision application. From my ah, okay, so that's why it comes forward at subdivision. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. Um, to a comment that Director Gavin had made, I muddled something in my brain. Um, when you were uh, trying to clarify for the Reeve um, on why a TIA would be beneficial now, um, you had mentioned something about looking at six lots versus eight lots, and um, something scrambled in my own brain, and I, my apologies. But if you could run through that again, um, in my head, I interpret it as, um, I guess what I need clarification on is if, if a TIA came back right now and it was recommended to reduce to six lots, is it easier to do that now or at the subdivision phase? Thank you for the question. Uh, the point I was just trying to make was having the assessment done on the maximum allowable density, and then it would provide us, I guess, addressing some of the concerns that we'd heard from the public, plus our own, potentially, uh, if it came back and said, yeah, the maximum, not an issue, then if the design did change at subdivision, whether it was for less or the maximum, and the assessment came back saying, you know, that there wasn't an issue um, with the maximum density, then it would, you know, I, I, get, I don't want to say speed things up. It obviously depends on the rest of the application, but at least um, mitigate that uh, requirement at, at the subdivision and give us um, more information to make an informed decision at this stage. Um, redistricting is an important part of this process, at least, you know, that's the position that we're coming from um, and just addressing that concern uh, right now, whereas all the other ones um, have been addressed to a certain extent through the preliminary studies that we had from um, the ASP project and then from the information we received uh, from Shell. Uh, we do have some uh, traffic count data from 2013, so it's 10, 11 years old, um, and there are other a uh, couple of other um, TIIs that we can take a look at, and we, we did discuss that with the applicant um, la last week or the week before um, about providing some of that data as well um, to assist. Um, but that's really all I was trying to say is if the assessment's done at the maximum density, then whether it changes is doesn't really matter too much, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's really all I was trying to clarify.
Is there any other discussion here or how are we moving forward? <coughs> I'm, I'm feeling uh, as though I'm supportive of moving forward with second reading without requiring the TIA at this point. I think the TIA would actually be more robust and wholesome at the subdivision stage when we know what exactly uh, they're looking for in terms of what the subdivision would be. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I think having, having that uh, right now uh, feels a little bit premature, uh, but not to say we don't need the TIA. I think we need the TIA at subdivision. I would like to make the motion that council provide second reading to without um, requiring further, further studies or information at this time. Thank you, we've got a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Do we have any more questions for administration or uh, debate for council? So I'm just, yeah, I, am, I keep seeing the importance of having this study. I guess the question I have to ask myself right now is the timing of this study and whether we're doing it at the proper time of redistricting or should be doing it at the proper time of subdivision. <clears throat> and as much as it does sound like, you know, these are requirements usually for a subdivision stage, <clears throat> I'm having a hard time as to seeing why I need, need to have one right at this point and not at the subdivision point. And that's just where I'm having a little bit of difficulty in understanding what, when this should be, whether it's today or at subdivision. I, I understand the difficulty. <laughs> and I think uh, like we're, we're all learning a lot from this process. And I think uh, going forward, um, if, we, if we want TIAs or we want EIAs um, at a redistricting stage, then we need to very clearly identify that as part of a redistricting application. I hope uh, if, if that's what we're looking for in the future, then that becomes part of our process. Um, and I know there's terminology in there in terms of like may or shall need, um, but that that doesn't necessarily mean to me that we need at this point even for the applicants to go through the process of and the expense of a TIA before they even know if they can do a potential development there. Um, so from that perspective, uh, wearing those shoes, which, which is what I always say my job is, is to wear the shoes of the residents and ratepayers of the MD. 
Um, I understand uh, that there's concerns around traffic and emergency egress and safety and where the entrance into a subdivision would or wouldn't be. But until we know what that subdivision might look like, it's really hard for me to understand how a traffic impact assessment is going to encourage me to not proceed with redistricting, no matter what the results are. It's like it's in the best interest of the applicant to understand a TIA and build a safe subdivision and community. And I'm and that's going to help them at the subdivision stage. Um, so that's that's where I'm coming from with waiting for a TIA until subdivision. But it is hard to see the lines that are very blurry between redistricting and subdivision. And yeah, go ahead, Councillor Smith. We'll see if I can get through this without coughing. Um, I sit today also as an MPC member when it comes to um, subdivision and seeing the impacts on council's decision as it goes forward to the next level. This ensures that this direction today is set at the council level. What do we want? Um, what precedents do we want to set? Do we going forward, do we require those things? Um, if we choose to go forward without getting it at the council redistricting level, then it's left up to the MPC members on how they would like to proceed and we have no say. So if we were to require the TIA and it come back saying something obscure that we're not expecting, we have no say in it anymore. And that's left to the MPC. Um, I don't anticipate anything obscure coming from this one, but it takes it out of our hands. And going, having done some redistricting, rezoning over the last couple of years, I feel that there are a few really important decisions that have been that should have been made at the council level that have been left to MPC. And that's why I'm struggling today. I don't think with my fluid filled lungs, I was clear with what, what my struggle was, but hopefully you can interpret something out of that. Yeah, I certainly heard you, I think, yeah. Is there any other discussion here? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm concerned about that as well. I don't know what to where we're at here before we call the question. I don't know if there's any guidance from our CAO. Well, there's currently a motion on the floor. My understanding is that the current motion is that council provide second reading to bylaw 25Z23 without requiring further studies and information. That's my understanding of the motion on the floor. Discussion has been continued with respect to the requirement of the TIA and then the concern about precedent setting. Well, there's already a section of the MDP, I believe, um, the section of the policy is 16.2.8, whereby the MD of Bighorn may require the preparation and approval of a detailed concept plan prior to the consideration of an application for redistricting or subdivision in accordance with Council's concept plan approval process policy. So there's no new precedence that is set today. Decisions are made on an individual basis. The the policy is already established. So I'm not sure where, I'm not sure how to point you in any specific direction um, with respect to your decision today. At this point, there's a motion on the floor. 
um, we would either need an amending motion or we would need to move forward with a vote on the current motion. Um, well, I guess, yeah, I'm still supportive of the current motion. And <laughs> I don't know what else to, I don't know what else to say. Um, I, it doesn't seem like everybody's ready for me to call the question yet. So if there's more discussion that's needed, uh, or if there's, uh, a different motion, uh, then we need to come up with that. Go ahead, CAO Tuck. Through the Reeve, I would like to remind you that you are sitting with an even number today and therefore any decisions made, if it comes to a tie, it means that that decision is defeated. Yeah. <laughs> Through the read. If you have a need to discuss this confidentially, you could go into closed session briefly to have a discussion and come out of. Can I get a motion to move into closed session? I would like to make the motion that council moves into closed session. On thank, thank you. I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you.
we're not yet. Okay, we're back into <coughs> open session here and uh, yeah, done with our closed session discussion. And I believe uh, we have some comments coming from it. Who would like to start the discussion? I can Go start ahead. the discussion. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I would like to say that I agree in part with the motion on the floor, but I do not fully agree with all of it. And I would like to make a subsidiary motion to modify the main motion to approve second reading. Thank you very much. So we've got a subsidiary, subsidiary motion on the floor. I cannot say that word. <laughs> um, is there any discussion around that? Okay. Do you have any further discussion to support your motion there, Councillor Fitzmaurice? All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, that would just be the difference of, let me just pull up the motion that was originally. So the original motion was uh, to approve second reading without requiring further studies or information. And this subsidiary motion will now take that place uh, to just approve second reading. Just to confirm everybody is Understanding, okay. And is there any further conversation or discussion before I call a question on that? Okay, I'll call the question all in favor and opposed. Thank you. And I believe uh, there is a second motion We have another motion coming. Yeah. <laughs> so just to clarify, <laughs> what passed was that the main motion was to approve second reading. So that was passed just now. And I am going to make a second motion that uh, council consider the need of a TIA before third reading. At, at third reading, sorry. And is there a discussion <laughs> on this? <laughs> is there <coughs> any discussion on this? I think it's important that there's some discussion. <laughs> okay. I'd just like to add that... Uh, I still feel the need for moving forward that this TIA does have impact and I do believe that it still needs to be looked at, but I think we can move forward from today and have some guidance for administration to move forward with as well as our applicants. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. Um, I also think that there is a huge amount of value to having all five councillors at the table for the discussion. Thank you. Councillor James, do you have anything to add to this? I would like to um, add that I feel that um, I want I have been fully respectful of what planning is bringing forward, and I want you to be able to, if you feel bringing this TIA forward again at third reading is important, and I want you to be able to have that opportunity as well as for um, the 
fellow counselors and having all five of us at the table to determine on whether it's necessary or not. Thank you. And I'm supportive of still uh, considering it at third reading and uh, would support uh, Councillor Smith's motion. Um, is there any further discussion before I call the question? All right, I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you, that motion is passed. All right, thank you very much for that. We had some process questions there that we were able to work through. Um, moving on to bylaw G2, or, or sorry, item G2 on page 47, bylaw 05Z slash 24 land use bylaw amendment, uh, section 4.15.11 and 8.4.1 C. The CAO Tut, can you please do the introduction? Thank you. I'd like to introduce Senior Planner Jenny Kasperwitz to present this bylaw reading. Uh, thank you. Uh, this bylaw 05Z24 um, is an administration-led bylaw, uh, which proposes an update to Section 4.15.11 of the Land Use Bylaw and provides clarification um, on the Development Authority discretion applied under Section 8.4.1C of the Land Use Bylaw. Uh, so the first amendment uh, was, is with relation to four point, section 4.15.11 of the land use bylaw, and it relates to timelines for the issuance of development permits for kennels. Uh, so basically, as it stands, um, kennels have a timeline, uh, development permit timeline of five years. Um, during a current development permit renewal application uh, for an existing commercial kennel, it came to our attention that since the previous development permit renewal, the government of Alberta has changed their regulations on tourism and commercial leases, which um, are TCLs. And uh, in 2019, the government extended the timelines for TCLs on provincial lands for up to 60 years. A change was made to help boost tourism growth by making it easier for tourism and commercial recreation operators to secure capital and operational financing. So in order to align the MD of Bighorn's land use bylaw um, with the new regulations and, and also give applicants more certainty when planning their future business operation and expansion, um, we've proposed that section 4.15.11 be amended to increase the flexibility of the development permit timeline um, above the 10 year period. Uh, so that would be removing the five year time period and instead leaving the timeline at the discretion of the development authority on a case by case basis. Um, and just to remind council, the development authority for discretionary uses is the municipal planning commission um, and any application for discretionary use requires uh, adjacent neighbor notifications uh, to be sent out. Uh, the amendment does not mean that the development authority will be approving a 60 year development permit. Um, it does allow for flexibility for us to work with applicants to come up with um, a, a more suitable time frame on a case by case basis. Um, and just for context, the development authority does have methods of um, ensuring that the applicant is abiding by their conditions of approval and that's through the stop order process in the Municipal Government Act. So even if we do have a development permit with no time frames attached to it, um, this is the MD's um, kind of assurance that we have a method of ensuring that people abide by their development permits. The proposed amendments are shown in red and um, it basically, uh, I'll, read, I'll read it out here. Uh, the development, a development permit issued for a kennel may be issued with a renewal time period at the discretion of the development authority and is subject to immediate re revocation if the kennel is not developed or operated in accordance with the conditions of the approval or if the kennel is deemed by the development authority um, to be having an adverse effect on the amenities of the area or nearby properties. Um, to ensure that um, that we do keep track of, um, you know, to ensure that kennels are operating within their uh, within the conditions of the permit, we've also added in red um, 
an addition to this section at the last sentence. So the development authority or designate may undertake a site inspection of the operation upon giving a 48 hours written notice to the applicant to ensure that the applicant is operating within the terms and conditions of the issued development permit. Uh, so that was the, the amendments to the first, um, to section 4.15.11. And I'll just move on to the second um, amendment, which is to section 8.4.1c of the land use bylaw. Um, this relates to the agriculture conservation district regulations. Um, and this was more of a clarification. Um, this arose uh, through a recent uh, subdivision application. Um, which the land, the quarter section, is intercepted by a creek, um, a permanent creek. Um, and so basically for context, section 8.4.1c of the AC district allows for an unsubdivided quarter section to be subdivided into a larger parcel than the maximum, which is 4.2 hectares, if the quarter section is severed or separated by a public road, railway, river, or lake from the balance of the land. So there was some um, confusion over whether a permanent creek would be considered for the purposes of this provision. Um, upon review of the section uh, by the Planning and Development Department, um, uh, we thought the intent of Section 841C is to provide flexibility for a larger parcel size where there's a logical separation by road, uh, river, um, water body. Um, and we believe that a permanent creek fits within the intent of the, the regulation because it creates a natural boundary from the remainder of the parcel. So we've uh, proposed the amended wording, um, and that would just be to add uh, creek as an option. Uh, so it would read, um, notwithstanding four above, where an unsubdivided quarter section is severed or separated by a public road, railway, river, creek, or lake from the balance of the titled land, a larger lot than the maximum of 4.2 hectares may be considered for subdivision at the sole discretion of the development authority. Um, and just as a reminder there, the development authority means the Municipal Planning Commission for subdivisions. So it would, it would appear before the Municipal Planning Commission. Um, due to the minor changes proposed by both of these uh, um, land use bylaw amendments, um, uh, we don't believe that either of the amendments will be affected by the MD's municipal development plan update process, um, and that's anticipated to be completed by the end of December 2024. Um, making the changes, um, we feel that it creates more flexibility and reduces red tape for applicants of subdivisions within the agriculture conservation districts and applicants with new or existing tourism and commercial recreation leases on provincial lands. So basically um, keeping our land use by law um, up to date as regulations um, change. Um, I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um, just a point of clarification, CAO Tut, if uh, since Councillor Tuza is not here, if first readings passed, would he be able to participate uh, as long as he can be involved in the public hearing. I need a moment to look into that, please. I know if he's not present for the public hearing, he cannot yeah. participate in second and third, but I need to do a quick check on whether the participation in first reading is required to follow mm -hmm. the process through. Thank you.
through the reef. I believe it is just with respect to public hearings and being okay. present at the public hearing and the ability to vote on subsequent readings. So provided that Councillor Atuza is available to be present for the public hearing when it comes forward, then he would be able to vote on second and third reading. Okay. It'd be similar to the resolution passed a yeah. little while ago with respect to a second reading. He would be able to be present for third reading. Okay. Thank you. I, that was my uh, interpretation. I just really wanted to confirm that. So um, thank you for that. Are there any questions of administration regarding the, these bylaw, land use bylaw amendments? Go ahead, Councillor James. Through the Reeve, um, this question um, will be um, directed to the first amendment on the kennels. Um, I would... Um, I am not sure, and maybe I just need some clarification on um, removing the five-year um, uh, renewal period for the development permit. Um, there are, I'm getting the impression that this is coming forward for kennels that are on um, Crown or public lands, but there are also kennels that are held on private lands. Um, and it seems that development renewals are required for most businesses or activities, retreats, and all of those kinds of things. And um, why would we want to remove um, a renewal or not have a set renewal time for kennel operations, especially like uh, when they are on um, private held lands with adjacent neighbors. Yeah, and good question. Um, you're right, some development permits in the MD are based on renewals and some don't have a renewal. Um, an administration stance on that is that a development permit can be issued, but um, it can be revoked if they're not meeting their conditions. And we have a mechanism to do that through stop orders. So renewals aren't necessarily um, the only way forward on this. Um, in addition, the TCL acts as the landowner authorization if it is on on. Uh, provincial land so if they no longer have that TCL then they would no longer have authorization to operate um, so in the in the case of a kennel on provincial land uh, a condition that a development officer could recommend to MPC is that um, it's only valid for the period of the lease uh, holding of the lease or they could say you know uh, in this case, I, we were comfortable with 10 years, 15. Um, they could provide no, um, no limit, but it, it is just an option to make, make things more, um, I guess, streamlined for de development processes. Not everything requires a renewal. It's just something that we have done here at the MD. Um, so we're, we're looking at that again and, and reevaluating and researching whether it's needed. So, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. I think that as far as the small holdings district, that that renewal um, uh, deadline is, is somewhat important for those, those properties. Um, that real goes, um, you know, to... Um, it, we're specifically looking at kennels, but those development permits for livestock are renewals of every five years. And it doesn't, to me, I'm not seeing the reason to remove kennels from that development renewal and not removing it for other things like um, for other livestock. So... Um, that's where that's where I am on that one. Yeah, I actually had a similar question. Um, just my question was, is this just for kennels, and why just kennels? Um, and 
I don't know if there's something in the MGA that triggered this just for kennels. Um, but why is this coming for just for kennels? Um, it's under the kennel regulation section of the land use bylaw. So certain uses have, um, in our land use bylaw, certain uses have renewals like visitor accommodation suites and I'm trying to think home-based businesses, kennels. Um, so that's why it's just for kennels because it's in the regulations for kennels section. Um, we can certainly propose an amendment to this prior to setting a public hearing and prior to first reading if we did still want to create a timeline around those. Um, but I think the director of planning also has some on that. Go ahead. Yes, through the Reeve, um, the kennels was the use that fits under this tourism lease. So there may be others, um, but this was the one that uh, that fits under that change that was made above us. And, and to uh, Councillor James's comments there, I mean, we can look at an amendment maybe for second reading, um, distinction between private and public lands, maybe that's an easier way to look at this. Um, but having a renewal time uh, that isn't defined and it's at the discretion of the DA, it would be on case by case basis. So if it was private lands, um, then MPC, we, you know, we would work with MPC on the timeline that's appropriate for that type um, of, renewal for, for the type of uh, development that it is, but the kennel uh, use is the one that fits under the change that was made at the provincial level, which is why the changes are just being made to that section and not the livestock. Thank you for that. And I think it is important to, to just reiterate and reassure um, council that even if this, uh, an issue period has been eliminated, that there are other ways to enforce conditions, and that is through stop orders and communications with yourself or uh, with the DO. So, um, yeah, I think it's important that we make sure we understand that too. Um, I'm just curious, you mentioned TCL. What is a TCL? the um, Tourism and Commercial Operator Lease on Provincial Land. So it's the name for the lease. Tourism, commercial. Type of disposition, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? I had a comment about the next uh, amendment, but are there any other questions? Comments or questions for this first one? All right. And on the second proposed amendment, are there any comments? Go ahead, Councillor James. Um, I would like um, to define whether a permanent creek um, is different than a creek. Um, and I think that um, I'm reading in the information um, that was given prior to the to the bylaw that we're looking for a permanent creek in this situation, um, and should permanent be included in your wording of permanent creek because a permanent creek is much different than a creek. And the, I, um, there can be small bodies of water flowing through that can cut ground easily, and those um, those that that uh, non permanent creek can move very easily. And that might have been why it wasn't included before. And we looked at it in a case by case scenario and worked with um, landowners that had creeks as dividing lines or not. I, I know of a couple where creeks did cut um, properties off. I live on one. Um, and, um, but the difference between a permanent creek and just a a temporary creek or a creek that is caused by a recent flood event um, and cutting an area may not be as sufficient as a permanent creek. We we could look at changing the wording. So you're you're saying change 
suggesting changing the wording to permanent creek in that right. list. If we're going to be yeah. defining those lines by something that mm -hmm. is solid, such as a r roadway, railway, lake, body, river, um, they those are all things that do stand permanence and it's understanding that we that we consider those um creeks are very temperamental or v fluctuate very easily they are not protected by uh necessarily environmental reserves um if we're if we're um a permanent creek could be and would likely be protected by environmental reserves that um, would um, safeguard that and make that um, that divisible line more understandable, whereas, um, yeah, so. I actually had uh, one of my notes here was, um, what if we remove river, lake, and creek and just say permanent waterway or water body. And I don't know if that would make it more clear. <laughs> um, because I think, it, yeah, I think uh, what Councillor James is talking about is also something I had a concern about uh, when you think of these temporary streams, per se. Are they creeks now? Um, so, uh, but then it's it's also hard when you live beside Exshaw Creek, <laughs> and that's uh, that is not a stream. <laughs> so, um, but I would consider that to be a permanent creek or a permanent waterway or water body. And I don't know how if there's a better way to define it. So, with your suggestion, that would also capture the seasonal creeks like Jura, because. Jura and Naksha are dry 10 months of the year, um, but they are definitely a permanent creek. Um, so that would incorporate, because that was where my hiccup was, was the seasonal creeks that are permanent but not always have water. So would your... Right, and my concern is that um, the uh, temporary creeks do move, and they're affected greatly by beavers, by um, drought, by floods, by and all of those things. And you can have a creek cut through a piece of property that may be there for a year or a season or ten years or something like that. Um, but there, there's uh, stabilities within permanent creeks that, that help define them, um, and that's why. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. So the land use bylaw does define water course or water body, um, and it does include, uh, I'll read it out here, it means any location where water flows or is present, whether or not the water flow or the presence of water is continuous, intermittent, or occurs only during a flood and includes but is not limited to A, the bed and shore of a river, stream, lake, creek, lagoon, swamp, marsh, wetland, or other natural body of water, or B, a canal, ditch, reservoir, or other man-made surface feature. Um, now, I would say that this definition doesn't really give you the confidence you need for the permanency of it, but I'm wondering if we could say a permanent water course or water body um, and add the words permanent. I, th I think, uh, well, I think I'd probably be comfortable moving forward with first reading with this and then leave that with you to bring back at second reading, uh, understanding that the permanence part of it is uh, important for, I think, our council to consider uh, with this amendment. <laughs> And I'll just note on that that um, it would be presented at the public hearing as is unless we make amendments um, to to this. Um. It's hard to make amendments on the fly because it's... Uh, or is there a way to pull up that definition or... Or is there a recommendation that you would like to bring forward.
through the wreath. Uh, my recommendation would be to perhaps move forward without making the amendments on the fly today. Um, uh, schedule the public hearing or move with the first reading. Schedule your public hearing. At the public hearing, council has the opportunity to ask questions of administration in the public hearing. And then you can ask those questions again and we can work on interpreting the questions and the responses and the desired actions at that point in time and continue the debate that way. And then anything that needs to be changed can come forward as amendments in second reading. Okay, thank you with that for that. And if, uh, if something like the, what we were just talking about with the permanent wording or the wording of permanent, uh, is that changing the direction or the intent of, because that's where I worry if we change it at second reading too much. Yeah. I don't think that it's of that level of significance that it changes the entire intent of the, the amendment. It just provides additional clarity in the wording. Okay. Um, how about for the um, first um, amendment, um, would that be changing the intent too much to be asking for a, uh, should should we come out of public hearing with an in, uh, with the desire of a, continue with a, a, a year's or um, uh, some type of renewal on that, is that changing the intent too much? coming out of public hearing. I think through the reeve to Councillor James, with respect to that one, I believe that the question is more private versus public lands as opposed to the timeline. The timeline is still provided in the, the land use bylaw. So I think that we still are fine to go into a public hearing and come out with the necessary amendments. I think the I don't think that it changes so much the intent of the m making the changes as opposed to just providing clarity. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Um, and then in terms of uh, if we're moving forward, uh, how will people be notified of a of a public hearing? Will all the people that operate kennels be specifically notified or? Or their neighbors, I suppose, as well. Uh, yes, we can, uh, in addition to what the Municipal Government Act requires for um, the newspaper advertisements, um, we can also look up the existing kennel owners, whether it's private land or public land. And um, you had mentioned as well the surrounding adjacent neighbors. Um, so we can do that for the notifications for mail outs of the hearing. Okay, thank you very much. I think that would be uh, appreciated by Council. <laughs> We do not have a motion on the floor yet. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Smith. I'm willing to make a motion that Council provide first reading of Bylaw 05Z24. Thank you very much. I think we'll do the public hearing in a second motion. Um, is there any further discussion uh, before providing first reading? Seeing none, I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you, motion is passed. And then we now need a second motion. I'm hoping administration might have some dates to pr suggest to us. <laughs> CAO Tech, go ahead. I would propose that we have this public hearing during the next council meeting, May 14th. Um, what's everybody's thoughts on that? They seem, I'd be worried we, our days would be getting very long with a public hearing in the middle of a council meeting. 
um, and that people might not be available during the day. Typically, our public hearings are in the evening, but what's I don't think we've ever tried holding one well, in our term. Um, I don't think we've had one during the day. I'm, I'm willing to give it a try and see if it works for public. Hmm? During our term? Oh, okay. Through the read? In the procedural bylaw, it does identify that public hearings can be held at regular or at special council meetings. So it can be held during a regular meeting. You could put it to a later time in the day rather than first thing in the morning. But um, with um, administrative changes to bylaws such as this, we generally don't have um, a large showing. Mm -hmm in person, um, however, we would receive a lot of, uh, or there's a potential to receive a lot of written correspondence that would attach to the public hearing. Um, so this would be one that would be a good one to try holding during a daytime meeting. Um, we have, prior to your term, we have had them and they've operated successfully. So mm -hmm. it's not something that's not been done by the municipality in the past. Yeah. Um, <coughs> thoughts on timing, I suppose. It's, it's almost like a delegation sometimes. It really is hard to continue the momentum of a council meeting with a delegation in the middle of it, but... I don't know if it would be better just to say three o'clock um, in hopes that our council meeting would be done by that time and then we can move into a public hearing. Yeah. If you scheduled it for three o'clock, you don't adjourn your council meeting until... You just recess. The, exactly. So you would yeah. finish the meeting, recess until the public hearing time, and then you would adjourn the entire council meeting upon conclusion of the public hearing. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to break at 10 o'clock from whatever discussion, because they need to start at the time that they're scheduled for. Mm -hmm. um, what's everybody's thoughts on that? For 3 o'clock? Yeah? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Would anybody like to make that motion then? Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we host a public hearing for bylaw 05Z slash 24 on Tuesday, May 14th at 3 p.m. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Any further discussion? I will call the question all in favor. Motion has passed. And I'm going to call uh, probably a 30 minute lunch break. Um, so what time is it now? We will be back here just before one o'clock. Thank you.
All right, welcome back here. We're moving on to item H1 under new business, climate adaptation and resiliency plan. CAO Tuck, can you please introduce your staff member? Thank you. Through the Reeve, I would like to introduce our manager of operational services, Kendra Tippy, to present. Good afternoon. So at the, so the climate adaptation and resilience plan was completed at the end of February. During the March GPC meeting, a motion was made to bring this item forward to council. The attached documents contain the detailed plan, a two-page executive summary documenting, documenting the highlights of the plan, and the presentation that was given at the March GPC meeting by the All One Sky Foundation. Today, administration has two recommendations. Number one, that council adopt the climate adaptation and resilience plan. Number two, that council directs administration to work towards implementation of the plan for future budget considerations. And I'm available for questions. Thank you very much for this. Are there any questions of administration? We kind of had, I think, two presentations of this mm -hmm. now and asked a lot of questions. During those, um, is there a recommendations page? I know. All right. This is always longer. The recommendations or implementation, that's where it was, yeah. I think it's one. 173 it starts at um and i that's what i just wanted to confirm is this starting at page 173 is that the implementation plan is that what where we're starting <clears throat> through the reeve to reeve roswald that is the presentation that was given mm -hmm by um, All One Sky Foundation. So if you go to, let me find the page number. It's gonna be before that. So page 149 has the executive summary. So that's the two-page document. So this is a summarized version of the um, 21 recommendations. And so these are the 21 items we would be working towards during the implementation. Okay. As far as uh, implement implementation plan, there's no like set timeline or mm -hmm. date attached to any of this stuff, that would all need to be worked out with administration. Right. Thank you. This was the chart I was looking for that I couldn't find. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that looks great, great and it's very clear. Um, and is this something that will be, can this, just this one pager, like this climate adaptation and resiliency plan, on page one, sorry, 149. Can that be shared with the public? Because I think it's uh, important information and, and then maybe a, a link to the whole document. But uh, I think it's really good for the public to see that we're taking this step and also taking off or starting to take off one of the boxes too uh, with our strategic goals. Um, is that part of, or is that something that you had, would plan to do? Yeah, through the Reeve to Councillor Roswald. So the whole plan, so the larger document that's presented before this executive summary is currently on the website. We just received this executive summary um, last week, I believe. So the intent is to get that on the website as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then... Um, so it can be shared, people can access it there, it can be shared through the website link, 
um, if you, yeah. Sure, I'll make the first motion that council adopts the climate adaptation and resiliency plan. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion on this plan? <coughs> I'm seeing none. I'll call the question all in favor. The motion is passed. And would anybody like to make the second motion? I'd like to make a motion that council directs administration to work towards implementation of the plan for future budgeting considerations. Thank you for that. And any further discussion on this? Can I, I'll call the question, all in favor? Thank you, motion is passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, the next item under new business is the fee assistance program, starting on page 181. And I believe we're just waiting for a staff member for this one. Thank you, Reeve Rosebold. For the presentation of the fee assistance program, I would like to introduce our community services coordinator, Doug Saul. All right, so um, just uh, restating that you have before you the um, proposal for the fee assistance program and that council review this uh, draft and uh, attachment A and then uh, approve the program policy or recommend it um, with feedback as applicable. Um, so some background is that uh, neighboring jurisdictions do have fee assistance programs for accessing educational, recreational, and cultural programs. And so this would provide a service like that in the MD Bighorn. I guess um, I would, in order to, uh, you know, direct comments to, in the most efficient manner, what questions do you have for me? <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for administration? Yeah. Go ahead, Councillor James. Thank you, and I think this was this was kind of exciting to see come forward. Um, I was I was kind of wondering about the affordability measure level, and I was wondering if um, where that um, level comes from, and if we feel it's adequate in our municipality. Yeah, great question. Um, there were a lot of examples and consideration um, put into coming up with the numbers. Um, so for instance, uh, Canmore has a tier one and tier two. Uh, Banff has a tier one and tier two. Um, there's uh, Red Deer County has different numbers. Uh, and Drayton Valley, for instance, has some different numbers, um, Jump Start, Kids Sport. Um, so there's a variety of numbers to look at. Um, and basically, these numbers were chosen considering it's uh, the position of the MD within uh, the Bow Corridor and taking into consideration the fact that there wouldn't be a at this stage anyways, a tier one and tier two, that it would just be one 
um, one uh, income level to go by. So uh, I guess in short, although not entirely accurate, it's kind of splitting the difference between tier one and tier two and looking at Banff versus Canmore versus um, uh, places like uh, Drayton Valley or, or Red Deer County. So I, I mean, I guess I, th I would say that they, they work, but I'm open to some feedback. Right. I w what is a tier one, tier two? So tier one would be for families with lower income and tier two is families with higher income. And that's done by um, Canmore and Banff. They do have quite an advantage in that they provide, they actually run the facilities. And so it's, um, it might be, that might ease their administration of the program that the folks would be applying for programs and also budget wise, um, it, there's some advantages for those administrations um, because basically they're getting revenue from families that might not have used um, those facilities but now would. So they've gone from potentially no revenue on those facilities for those families to some revenue. Um, so this is a different model, more based on um, Red Deer County and uh, Drayton Valley. Thank you for that. Are there any more questions? I had a question, Mr. Sol. I know uh, I see that you've made a few uh, changes since this came to GPC, and I uh, like those changes. One of the changes that I'm just curious to learn why um, was the class course or programs must have a minimum fee of $90 or more to qualify. Why, mm -hmm. why have the minimum included? Uh, it's really for, to make the administration of it realistic in that if there was a series of, you know, $7 and $15 programs, it might, it might become overwhelming um, to administer. Um, and I also modeled it off some other similar fee assistance programs that actually had um, higher levels. Like for instance, you, a person had to be, or a family, an individual had to register for a camp or minimum four classes. Um, and then I did look at so the, the cost of, um, you know, sort of bread and butter, kind of like swimming lessons and things like that. And I found that $90 was, was you know, would catch, capture most of those. Thank you. I like that answer. And I guess one thing that it didn't I didn't understand before is somebody could sign up for four, four programs or it's classes, courses, or programs with a NAS. So um, they could submit that all at once, even if it's rock painting and for sure. rock climbing. And uh, that adds up to $100. That can be one submission. Sure. Yeah. And, and, um, it would be the first year that this would be in place, and the policy, of course, states that it can be, you know, amended and revised um, to, you know, be more effective. Um, yeah, and the the applicant has to be pre-approved, and the programs have to be pre-approved so that they, you know, we're not backpedaling and, and going back and forth on that. So um, that would fall under what you're talking about, this kind of discussion to package together some programs, yeah. Awesome. Do you see this as being something that uh, you're going to be able to administer with, <laughs> without it, without you yourself having to pull out your hair? Oh, <laughs> well, uh, definitely not uh, pulling out the hair. But uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I in discussion with um, other municipalities that do this and the percentage of folks who would qualify and then the percentage of folks who go ahead to access the program. Um, I'm feeling confident that it would, it would be quite manageable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's enough sort of learning buffer in there that if it becomes kind of like, oh, didn't expect that, um, then the policy within, you know, from now till next year, Ten nine months or so can be revised and tweaked actually at any time to uh, 
you know, with, with council's approval to make it more effective, more efficient. Yeah. And do you have any idea how many families might uh, apply for a program like this in the MD yet? Or have you had much uh, interest mm -hmm. or people asking if this program's coming? You know, I've, I've had just one um, worker for someone inquire about this. I haven't had any direct um, questions or, or rec, you know, requests for this sort of thing. Uh, and I did, with the other jurisdictions, as I said, there's a, quite a difference between people who would be eligible and people who, who apply because maybe they just don't have an interest in those programs. Um, and then the the work that Har Group did on the REC survey does give a an estimate um, and point to certain census criteria that you can look at to see how many families would be eligible. Interesting. Thank you for that. I know I've had uh, some families approach me asking if we have a similar program to Canmore. So um, it's great to see that we may be putting this into place. Is there any other discussion? Go ahead. Um, through the Reeve, I think the kind of the neat thing about this program, as far as I'm reading it, is that it's not just selected to to families and children, but it's selected to individuals. It could be an elderly person wanting to get out and participate into a into a program and maybe be in retirement and be able to to access programs. Um, I think that that's kind of a kind of a neat thing. I do kind of question the eligibility on household income. Um, it's we don't have a lot of um, um, I, rental properties, um, or certainly people being able to afford homes that would be able to be able to qualify in in this in this number. Um, and I just kind of wonder about that. Um, and I may be um, um, incorrect on that. And I mean, on one hand, I think that these numbers look fine, but I also kind of wonder what is the, the kind of medium um, basis and how many people do we, you know, where, where do we fit in, in needing able to, to provide these things? But I do think that it is some, um, something that's um, really neat that is across the board for all people. Well, in terms of hard numbers, it's, it's, I think it's difficult to get a precise number because the um, year that the census was done and then movement around there and then also the many different indicators that are used like low income cutoff versus market basket. Um, there's... There's many different of these uh, approaches, and for instance, um, some some fee assistance programs use low income cutoff, um, and some use quite a different. Like for instance, Red Deer County would use 200 percent of the low income cutoff, so it's quite a bit higher. Um, and so again, it, it just makes it uh, interesting exercise to try and establish what those numbers should be, because some of the numbers are quite low. Um, a, a family would have to have a you know, uh, income of $25,000. And, but then in other jurisdictions, it might be 40, 50, $60,000. So it's, it's quite a, yeah, it's quite an exercise to find a, a number that, uh, to start with to see, okay, well, let's try this number and see how that goes. So that we could look at that as we go forward and know if we're hitting enough people depending on how, if it's, if people reach out to use it and they don't qualify, or if they're um, not reaching people because we don't, nobody, there are very few are qualifying. That's and right. And then you yeah. could go forward in adjusting that. Yeah, for instance, um, I don't know about Banff, I, I suspect it's the same, but I know Canmore didn't start with tier one and tier two. They started with just tier one. Um, and uh, I'm just inferring from, from what they did, but they maybe they found that, oh, well, there was some families that had higher income but still had difficulty affording um, as many programs as they felt were really going to be great for their family. So then they established Tier 2 after afterwards. Awesome. Thank you.
Would anybody like to make a motion? on page 181. Where's well, I think, sorry, I think Wait. now the motion would be that council uh, approve the fee assistance program policy. Correct. And attachment A. Sure. I would like to make the motion that council approve the <coughs> draft um, fee assistance <coughs> program policy and attachment A. I think it's, I guess it could be draft yep. and it's not draft once it's approved. <laughs> That's oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got that. Perfect. I just read it. Um, is there any further discussion? I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on to item H3, page 187, audit extension request. CAO Tut. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> through the read today, I would like to request an audit extension approval. With the recent changes in corporate and community services department, the municipality is going to require additional time to complete the financial statements and prepare the financial information wow. return. Time extensions to submit financial reporting, including the financial statements and financial information return, may only be provided under specific criteria as a identified by the municipal affairs. I've attached the criteria that municipal affairs requires as attachment one on the next page. Today, I am asking that council request municipal affairs provide a deadline extension for the submission of the audited financial statements and financial information return for the following reasons. Reason number one being the director of corporate and community services position will be vacant in excess of one month between the dates of March 25th, 2024 and May 1st, 2024. As well, there is, um, potential that there may be, the municipality may be subject to a material <laughs> restatement from the prior year's financial once we have an opportunity to go through through the, the documents um, that are required. So based on these two criteria, we do meet the requirements of municipal affairs to request the extension. We're just seeking the council approval to move forward with that request. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you know if these are ever requested and denied? There's a possibility that it gets denied, and I don't know what we would do in that case. <laughs> because we meet the criteria, Right. Um, there would be no, reason to. no benefit to Minister McIver's office denying the request. <coughs> if we were unable to provide proof, um, mm -hmm. The, just the one month date alone is enough right. to right. to secure that for us. Um, I don't have the amount of the material restatement at this time, but okay. it is my understanding that there may be some restatements from last year's financials. What's restatement mean? Uh, it, it's an adjustment that's being done. So if something was not in yet, say, at the end of the year, and we did the financials, and we needed to add it. So if it's over a certain threshold, then you have to revisit the previous year's books and account for it in the proper year, as opposed to just adding it. So if it's immaterial, then it could just go in the 2023 financial statements, and it wouldn't be an issue. If it's material, you want to open your 2022 financial statements and state it in the proper year as a prior period adjustment. And by doing a prior period adjustment, then you're restating that financial statement. So by doing that restatement, and usually materiality is established by the auditors, and ours historically has ranged anywhere from $32,000 upward of $60,000. So it's not an overly large number um, when compared to the budget to become a material item so 
All right, thank you very much for that. Is there any questions about this? All right, seeing none, um, would somebody like to make the first motion? It can just be one motion. Oh, okay. Um, go ahead. Um, I'll make the motion that council request municipal affairs to provide a deadline extension. Thank you. Now I see what the one and two were. Um, any further discussion? Okay, I will call the question all in favor. Thank you. The motion has passed. All right, moving on to page 189, funding of FCM committee members resolution. CEO Todd, go ahead, please. Thank you, Reeve. Today, administration is asking that council support the proposed resolution regarding funding for the elected officials participating on FCM committees brought forward to the 2024 Spring RMA Convention by Mountain View County. This was an item that was brought up at the Spring Zone meeting that established which resolutions would be moving forward. And as part of the new process through the RMA resolution process, um, motion of council is required for the seconding municipality or supporting municipality to the resolutions. And somehow this squeaked by without us having a formal motion. So this is just closing the circle on the resolution that went forward and was the only resolution defeated at RMA. Oh, we don't need to talk about that part. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is just uh, kind of an administrative uh, catch up here. <laughs> um, is there any discussion? Would anybody like to make the motion? Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that council support the proposed resolution regarding funding for elected officials participating on FCM committees. Thank you very much. Um, any further discussion? I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you. Sorry, Mountain View County. We will be on it next time. <laughs> Um, moving on to uh, the first uh, addition to the agenda, item H5, Nursing Proclamation Week. And CAO Tet, please go ahead. Thank you. Today, administration is asking for council to acknowledge Nursing Week being May 6th through 12th, 2024. Um, we have recognize this proclamation in the past with respect to nursing week. So nurses in our community have given citizens so much over the past years and nursing week is an excellent opportunity for municipalities to recognize the contributions that nurses make to their communities and those also visiting the areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this one's a no-brainer for council and uh, it's great for us to recognize all the nursing staff in the Bow Valley that help uh, help our residents and I guess in Cochrane as well and uh, all the residents uh, that work as nurses so thank you very much to all of them. Um, would anybody like to make this motion? Sure. I'd like to make the motion that council accept the request for administration to acknowledge Nursing Week, May 6th through the 12th of 2024 on the MD website. Thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion? I'll call the question all in favor. Motion has passed. Thank you. Item H6, Fire Guard Initiative. CEO Tut, please do the introduction. Thank you, Reeve Rosevold. For this presentation, I would like to introduce Director of Protective Services and Fire Chief Andrew Box. 
Good afternoon. Thank you. Through the CAO, um, Council, we're looking for a recommendation that Council provides a resolution to support the application to the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta, also known as FREA, for the design and construction of fire guards within the MD of Bighorn. Earlier this year, the Government of Alberta announced a three-year, $15 million program uh, to better prepare communities uh, to be wildfire ready. The Community Fire Guard Initiative provides financial support for at-risk communities to construct fire guards, which are an important tactic, use, tactic used in wildfire suppression. Uh, once this information was brought out, uh, we assembled a team of um, interested parties uh, from the Bow Valley, which included Alberta Parks, Alberta Wildfire Management, Parks Canada, Town of Canmore, Kananaskis Improvement District, Freer, and ourselves. Fire guards are cleared areas that can range in width uh, from 100 meters to one kilometer and are constructed by a variety of forestry means, mechanical, heli logging, uh, thinning and such. Uh, I've included a map with the proposal. This is not intended to be the boundaries of the fire guards. We have just highlighted the areas where the fire guards would be put. Um, and again, I... I conceptual drawing. We'll make sure that was underlined with my tone. Um, the proposal identifies in-kind funds of approximately $5,000 for project oversight, likely to be carried out by myself. Um, the town of Canmore has offered to step forward as the lead proponent for this project. Thank you very much. Um, just for clarity on the map, is the what areas are being proposed? Is it the green or the yellow? It's the green. The yellow, I believe, primarily shows the boundary of the town of Canmore. So it's all of those green areas. The and I apologize for the um, uh, the legend getting cut off there. So the orange areas that you see are areas that have had some pretreatment done. Oh. So that's some of our earlier mitigation measures. And obviously, as you, we can see in the top left corner there around the community of Harvey Heights, the fire guard would be out in front of those um, those pre-treated areas. So any of those areas that you see in the block of green um, is where we're looking to construct or where we propose um, some fire guard placement. Obviously, we would bring to the table um, a lot of very smart people, hopefully. Um, I've done a little bit of work of, in forestry in my background, and I know that laying out a cut block um, you know, you really have to look at what your end construct is going to be. You don't want to leave a uh, stand of trees that are going to be a complete wind down, blown over area, for instance. You're typically always going to get a little bit of blowdown because you're exposing those trees to the, the full forces of our sometimes windy conditions in the Bow Valley. Um, but, uh, you know, those people would obviously be brought to the table. Um, I would like to identify that much of this was brought together by Mr. Stu Walkinshaw, who is a recognized uh, specialist in this area, and I believe also has a background in forestry. Thank you. I believe he does, too. Um, and are there any other questions around this? Go ahead. Um, through the reeve, the um, the map shows one area of the MD. Are there other areas of the MD that are being um, fire guard initiative? Not for this grant application, primarily due to some of those other areas that you're referencing are primarily private land holdings. We assess the areas around the other communities and, and unfortunately that would be our biggest stumbling block was the places where we would want to put the fire guards are our privately owned lands. Okay. Great, thank you. Oh, go ahead. I'll ask the question that I usually do. Um, there is somewhere to pull this 5,000 from. There's a a budget. It's a uh, in kind, uh, just for project oversight. We basically and you did write that in there. Yes, I see it now. Thank you. 
you're getting me at a pretty good rate, actually, what he... Uh... <laughs> Apparently, when I skimmed, I skimmed right over that in kind. No problem. And I'll ask the question that I always <laughs> ask is, uh, before this gets going, how will people be notified? Or is that part... In all honesty, we're just at the application okay. side, um, but we've already identified that um, similar to our other freer application, uh, you know, there would be a, a lot of communication going out, hopefully some residential engagement ahead of time as okay. well uh, to get people to come to the table and, uh, you know, have them give them the opportunity. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting, especially considering the west and north side of Harvey Heights uh, in regards to dealing with our federal partners, because literally we're proposing a fire guard that literally goes right up to Banff National Park boundary. Yeah. That will be I'm sure there will be some interesting discussions. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, would anybody like to make a res a motion, sorry, to support this application. Go ahead, Councillor Fitzmaurice. I'd like to make a motion that council provide. I'd like to make a motion that council approve support of the application for the Forest Resource Improvement Association of Alberta for the design and construction of fire guards within the MD of Bighorn. Thank you for that. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor? <coughs> Motion has passed. Thank you for that. Um, the next item of business, um, I actually brought up to new business from correspondence it was item j10 page 239 of the agenda package um, and this was a letter from minister lowen um the minister for forestry and parks and uh, this comes uh, as a result of a meeting uh, that our council members and CAO had with him uh, this past November in Edmonton. And uh, there's some suggestions and recommendations in this letter that I think our council needs to discuss. Go ahead, CAO Tut. Apologies, Reeve Rosefold. Through the Reeve, I was wondering if we should postpone discussion on this as that it is, uh, it directly impacts Councillor Tuza's ward and we could bring it forward to either the GPC in two weeks or to the May Council meeting. Just because some of the action items are items that significantly impact yeah. us. Yeah. Well, I think that was, I guess, the direction I was going to go is okay. maybe. Uh, we bring this forward to next, the next GPC or council, uh, maybe with some guidance from administration on how we have this discussion. Um, Through the Reeve, I can bring it forward to a senior management team meeting okay. for discussion, and then we can bring it back to GPC. Perfect. Thank you for that. And do we need a motion for that? I would ask for a motion. Because I brought it to new business. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, go ahead. <laughs> Just one question. Is there anything that we need out of this? Uh, it does say to contact Rob Simrich if, uh, if we need to discuss. And I know we're meeting with him next week. So is there anything that needs to be brought forward to Rob that we need to deal with today? Or... Can we just make a motion for administration to look at this? I think we have administration look to <coughs> into this and then make sure we bring a copy of this to that meeting. <laughs> well, then I'll bring forward that motion. Okay. 
however <laughs> I just worded it, um, uh, to direct administration to how to proceed or I, however, sure, for administration to bring to GPC. Wonderful, thank you. Any further discussion <coughs> on bringing this forward? I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you. All right, um, that takes us to the end of new business. Moving on to inquiries of administration. I will start with Councillor Smith. None this time. Thank you. Councillor Fitzmorris. I have none at this time. Thank you, Councillor James. I have none at this time. Oh, you guys are gonna leave them all to me this week, or this month. <laughs> um, one of my inquiries of administration was, uh, revolves around uh, the level of service discussion that we started for the CPO program. And I was just wondering uh, when we can circle back to that and bring that back to Council. Through the CAO, um, I was awaiting uh, our discussions and questions uh, that we had spoken about at the February GPC meeting. Um, I didn't receive anything um, from the CAO in regards to those follow-up questions yet on regards to the fire service level of service policy. And we were awaiting that because we wondered if the... Um, format of the document or any of those things would be addressed in those questions. So we were waiting for that shoe to fall before um, bringing the uh, CPO one forward. Okay. Well, that is good to know. <laughs> um, I guess we will circle back here to council then. <laughs> the ball's in our court. So... From an administrative perspective, ultimately, we'd like to bring forward the discussion back to the April GPC. Um, the fire services policy is the one that is critical right now as we are entering negotiations, I believe, this week or next week with, um, or not negotiations, entering preliminary discussions with the town of Canmore regarding our expiring fire services agreement. Um, so this is a priority for administration to move forward with <clears throat> with respect to our discussions with Canmore as they will help guide our, our conversations as we have over the next few months with them. So it is critical that we bring this back as soon as possible and as well just to, to f sort of close the loop on the the peace officer program as well. It would be nice to start having that move forward through the next few months and try and get that finished off in the, the second quarter. Okay, thank you for that. And then I also just had a question uh, of where we are at with the HAR group implementation plan. Or has that been started <laughs> or... I'm not sure who's leading that. <laughs> so with respect to, through the Reef, with respect to the HAR group implementation plan, um, I will be working with the various departments on how we can move forward with that. We are currently in the midst of the trail um, master plan. So that is one of the items that came out of that HAR group. So that is currently being implemented. The policy that we just passed today is another item that was identified through the HAR group studies with respect to provision of recreation for lower income families. So we are slowly working our way through that with the changes that are occurring under the Corporate and Community Services Department. Um, I have to revisit and identify what priorities that director had established with the community services coordinator with respect to 
reviewing the implementation of the hard group report, but I'm hoping to have an update by the next council meeting for you to provide in inquiries. Perfect, thank you. Or very in much. response to the inquiry. Okay, wonderful, thank you very much. Um, and that's all for inquiries. I can feel my chair lowering again. <laughs> Got the broken chair today. <laughs> Rick planted it here and he's not even here. <laughs> um, okay, moving through to correspondence information. Uh, are there any items there uh, to highlight or that there were questions of? I had one question uh, Go ahead. in regards to the enforcement services charts <clears throat> on page 197. I'm just looking at the one chart that says offensive zone, subzone of reports. And it's got, I'm just looking for clarification where it says in red is the MD of Bighorn, green is Dead Man's, yellow is Exshaw, purple is Harvey Heights. Where it says red is MD Bighorn, is that referring to the ranch lands area? Or it just seems kind of weird the way that it's written. One nine seven. And then I'm just also wondering if maybe it's a not that big deal, but is it a typo? As all of the count reports are at 37, and then this one has a total report count of 38. I could only offer a speculative answer at this point. I believe the uh, MD Bighorn would be representative of any of those areas outside of those hamlets. Um, but I would prefer to seek clarification from our Sergeant of Enforcement Services to ensure that I give you some correct information. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, there was also on page 215, uh, our newsletter, um, I had sent some uh, edits already along for the, the Reeves remarks, some of, the, some of it got uh, changed somehow, but um, just on the first page of the newsletter, uh, it says, if you no longer want to receive a hard copy, Newsletter in the mail, scan this QR code and let me know. I think it should say, let us know. <laughs> I don't know who me is, so um, let us know. Um, the Reeves remarks have been edited and I've passed those off to our executive assistant. Um, on page 219 or page 8 of the Newsletter, there is an advertisement for the Jamison Area Structure Plan open house that has already happened. So that can be removed. And there was something else. I'm not sure if that uh, next page uh, on 219, so it would be page nine of the newsletter that might also have to be removed. I think it might all be connected, but it's possible we could replace that with upcoming. <laughs> We've got workshops upcoming for Jamison Road, Air Structure Plan, and MDP open houses that are going to be coming up. So um, I know we don't necessarily have those dates selected, but maybe just letting people know that that's coming up. Yep. Um, on your um, Reeves um, remarks, um, did you include the Jumping Pound Community Hall in your 
edits that were sent forward. It is a hall that is used by um, members of the South Ward 3 that is regularly. Good to know. And I double checked that with a couple of residents, and they okay. were like, oh, yes. Perfect. I will add that then. Um, maybe Carol, I'll get that edit back from you <laughs> and I'll add that in. And do you happen to have a contact information, contact email for them? I do. I have a, an email anyway. Okay. That you can... Thank you. So I'll take that and add it to the, I thought I was missing one. <laughs> um, is there anything else for, Oh, and then, sorry, there was one more thing. On page 226, the public information session on transit will have already passed as well by the time the newsletter goes out. So that page can also be removed. Okay, that's, are both of those separate then? Sorry, I'm having a hard time with page numbers here. I can't tell what page, 226. So, so the KID MD Bitcoin Transit Plan is not part of the newsletter because I think it should be. With the one with the QR code? Through the reef. The QR code is a stuffer that'll go in the same envelope package. The other is just information in the council package, the second page. It's a one page stuffer that's just being added. It's not actually part of the newsletter, it's separate. Okay. To, so to be clear, like that will still go out with the newsletter. It will still newsletter. be mailed with the dirt and the newsletter. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Councillor Smith. I, if as long as we've moved on from the newsletter, I have one more thing. Okay, and hopefully I'm not stealing your thunder. Okay, um, I wanted to highlight on page 243 of the package a letter from the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators. Um, we received a letter. Um, uh, about our CAO, who is um, had a uh, to quote this remarkable ten years of service in municipal government management roles. So I'd like to extend the congratulations to our CAO, and thank you for your dedication. Yay! <laughs> thank you. Each speech. <laughs> I did receive a very beautiful 10-year service award pin from the Canadian Association of, Immun of Municipal Administrators. Um, it's, it, it's definitely an honor to be recognized for that type of service. So I do appreciate the recognition received and I love what I do. So Thank you. And we love that you're here with us so thank you all right um can i get a omnibus motion accepting all items j1 through 12 with the exception of 10. go ahead i'll make the motion as stated okay <laughs> thank you any further discussion i'll call the question all in favor Thank you. All right, and we've got one item to discuss in closed session. And can I get a motion to move into closed meeting? Councillor Chris Morris has it. I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you.
All right, we're back in open session now, and Councillor Smith has a motion coming forward. Okay, I'll make a motion that Council postpone the Jameson Area Structure Plan project until a presentation is held with WSP. We'll make a decision May 14th. Thank you. Any further discussion on this? Uh, I'll call the question all in favor and oppose. Thank you. All right, that concludes this month's council meeting. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn? Councillor Smith has it all in favor. Thank you.